We're joined today by the one and only Lee Gorman, founder, bassist for the band Bow Wow Wow. Lee, how you doing today? Dustin, I'm doing good. Well, first of all, it's an honor speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're very welcome. It's an honor speaking to you, Dustin. It's very <laughs> kind of you to ask. Well, I know uh, Bow Wow Wow is uh, on the road here playing some shows. Uh, first of all, how how are the shows been going here so far with this current tour? Uh, they've been going great. And um, I don't know if you realize that my band is the one with the different singer. Sure, yep, yep. All right, yeah, it's just some people get confused because... Anyway, but um, they've been going great. You know, we've got really good uh, reaction. I, we, I always have. Um, uh, the music speaks for itself. It has an inbuilt energy, and it's like uh, taking the, the serum from when we were 20 years old and taking that energy and, and reproducing it 35, 40 years later, and it still has that same effect on people when they hear it and, and the same effect on me and, and the band when we play it and sing it so in, in answer to your question you know it's, it, it's, it always goes well that's one of the reasons i still do the music of bow wow because i've played a lot in other bands and especially when i was beginning and there's always be this debate after the show so how did it go i think it was okay there's never even a debate <laughs> we always know it went well <laughs> and this is a complete disaster like a technical breakdown Awesome. Yeah, it, it seems like the new lineup is uh, working well together. Are you guys going to continue to play shows into the next year here? Yes, yes. We've got shows booked in uh, uh, California. I'm just thinking back, looking back in my head by our, our schedule, which we need to post. Yeah, we've got some updated shows coming up, but mainly in Southern California. In Los Angeles, we're playing a Whiskey A Go Go in February, if you're online listeners or in the LA area. We're playing Long Beach in January the 6th, and we're playing at the uh, Coach House in Juan Capistrano, Southern California. So there's a lot in Southern California, but we, we usually end up playing Texas or the East Coast. You know, all over America, we're very fortunate. Excellent. Yeah, it seems like a lot of bands from, from that era, you know, kind of the new wave sound, they're really finding a second life now on the road. Maybe it reminds people of a happier time. That, that's true. I think it does. I mean, every show we do, there's people come up to us with such beautiful stories saying, you know, oh, we were on the way to the, to the hospital when our daughter was being born and, you know, I Want Candy was being played on the radio. So, you know, we called her Candy. or you know, just, just beautiful, <laughs> sweet stories like that. And, uh, you know, I remember I met my husband when we saw you 35 years ago or, you know, so it's wonderful that people can relive, you know, great moments in their life and, and, um, and relate to the music that we did and still do. I, I, that really gives me a, a, a big buzz that, you know, it's so nice to, to be, res- or not responsible, but be associated with something positive in people's lives. Sure. Well, Lee, can you talk a bit about your your influences? Uh, you know how you developed your playing style because there was a lot of different sounds back then. But Bow Wow Wow always really seemed to be doing something even more different than everybody else was. That's right, that's, and that's another reason I still love to play play live with this band. Um, I I, uh, I started in about 1974 when I was a teenager, and I was doing guitar at school. Uh, used guitar lessons and I was playing classical guitar for the orchestra and doing, you know, learning to read music and, and I liked playing flamenco and I found I could improvise easy. And we also had a little rock band and we used to do, uh, they were, you know, 13, two of the guys were 13 and I was 14 and we played Led Zeppelin and, um, Black Sabbath, you know, and all those kind of covers, Smoke on the Water. <laughs> uh, deep purple all, all that stuff and we loved doing it and I ended up singing it too and we stayed to, we were called Lazy after the Deep Purple song and uh, our guitar player Alan Murray he was the one that uh, taught me how to play bass he was an amazing guitar player At 13 years old he could play note for note J- Jimi Hendrix solos Richie Blackmore you know he was incredible and a great talent and um he went on to do music, like well, head of music at a university or something. Years later, we stayed in touch over the years, and he used to come to the Bow Wow shows. But he was the one that actually taught me, you know, 
in simplified fashion, four bars on that note, count four on that note. And gradually, I started to jam uh, along with uh, records. I'd set up my little amplifier with my mum and dad were out and play, you know, all the records that I had, which were mainly, you know, bad company. I remember playing bad company. <laughs> and then one of my girlfriend's brothers, I had a girlfriend back then, uh, when I was about 14, we just started playing, and her brother, he was a bit older, he said, oh, I, I tried playing bass, and I gave up, so he says, I've got a book you might want to use, so he, he gave me this bass instruction book, and I looked at, at a diagram of the fretboard, and I had one of those eureka moments, where I looked at the fretboard, and I figured out, oh my god, that's where all the note, you know, that's where all the octaves are, and that's where all the, you know, the you know about music you know about the pentatonic scales the five note scale which are all the black notes on a keyboard uh, which are the, what we call the blue scale and that's a lot of bass is based on that anyway that all added up in like half a second it's such a weird thing and i picked it up and i realized i could go all the way up and down the fretboard board based on what key and what and, and so i just started doing that and that that allowed me to improvise more on the guitar which i was learning at school Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling on a little bit. <laughs> but that's, that's how it happened. And then I started getting into funk music, you know, soul music. Uh, that was a big thing in the East End of London in the 70s. And, um, you know, we, believe it or not, we were all into sort of American soul music uh, after sort of heavy metal. I got into that. And then there were some fantastic players. There was a guy called Stephen Amazing who played with Jeff Beck and he had a name, band called Up. When I was about 16, 17, I used to go and see him live, and he was just an incredible player. And then I got into Percy Jones from Brand X, which was Phil Collins' side project when he was in Genesis. It was like a jazz funk. Okay. Um, it, was, it was more jazz, but it was funky. And he played fretless, and he played a wild bass, which I also got into. Uh, and, of course, Stanley Clark and... and um, uh, Jacko, Pastorius, you know, I, I can't claim to be as good as those guys, but they did, they did uh, influence me, as well as playing rock, and then punk rock, we throw that all in, you know, punk rock hit 75, 76, and I used to go and see the bands, and um, so, I don't know, I combined all that stuff, and then I got asked to join Adam and the Ants in 1979, when I was about 18, and... Um, I'd, I'd been in a band with, with the guys from Wang Chung, uh, Nick and Jack from Wang Chung, and Glenn sure. Gregory, who went on to be in Heaven 17, and uh, Darren Costin, who was one of the guys in my original band, Lazy. We were in a band called 57 Men, and we went touring around England, uh, playing little clubs and pubs for about a year, when I was about 18, 17, 18. And we got on great. We, we, we had a blast. And... Uh, Glenn was, is such a nice guy. <laughs> um, we never had one argument or anything. No, no, it, we just had a blast. But we didn't get anywhere. Did a, we did a big showcase at Camden, a place in London called Camden. Uh, the, the venue was Dingwalls in Camden, Camden Lock. We did a showcase for all the record companies, and they, they turned us down. But at that showcase was uh, a guy called Knox from a band called The Vibrators. Um, a punk band in London and he recommended me to uh, add add a man so we broke up 57 men Nick Jack Glenn we all broke up they went off like a year year or two later to form Wang Chung and I was left bandless (laughs) and um, so I got a call from Dave Barbarossa the drummer in Adam and the Ants at the time to come and audition for Adam to play for Adam Ant I went to the little office, I did the audition, and they gave me the job. And then the next day, I had to, le- I had to learn 40 songs that night. Oh. And the next day, I had to rehearse. And a couple of days after that, at Malcolm McLaren showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and then the rest is history. So I had all those influences of jazz, heavy metal, punk. Uh, jazz had a lot of Latin into it, so I liked Latin and flamenco. And... Uh, and then I, but I could also hit it hard for punk. I enjoyed the energy and speed of punk. And, um, so I just threw it all in there. And then Malcolm saw it in me and encouraged me. And so did Adam. 
And then turns out Dave Barbarossa was into Santana, which is, you know, Latin. So we, me and him kind of hit it off. And we, we started doing this weird stuff. And Malcolm McLaren just gave us loads of rec- records, vinyl, that he went to a world music store. Music from Africa, Latin America, Australia, Czechoslovakia, and basket weaving music. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. And we would just listen to it and try and soak it in. And um, anyway, the, the one key thing that I suppose started it was Adam and, and Malcolm McLaren wanted to give us a test. They gave us a cassette with 23 songs on it, which were from all over the world. And they had glam rock songs on there. They had uh, Elvis Presley songs on there. Songs from the musical Oliver. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Uh, uh, Turkish belly dance music. And they, they wanted, Malcolm wanted to test us how CI would interpret it and tell us that, um, you know, this was 79. 1980 was coming up. We need to come up with new music and Adamant needs to change his style. Maybe you should let these guys have a go. You know, this new bass player that's into jazz and whatnot. So we got this cassette and over the Christmas break, I listened to it and tried to analyze the structure, you know, uh, and Adam pulled me to one side before I went back, went home to the break and said, you know, you've got to do something. Come on, I'm expecting you to come up. So Malcolm McLaren did the same thing, (laughs) pulled me to one side, said, Lee, it's up to you. If you want to stay in this band and do something cool, you've got to come up with something. So I was sweating blood. <laughs> and, um, and Malcolm and Adam were very tough kind of people. I'd never experienced people like that before. I'd always been around people like Nick and Jack from Wang Chung and Glenn Gregory, who were just very convivial. And we never argued. These guys were tough as nails. I told you I had to learn 40-something songs from like 7 p.m. the night before till 11 a.m. I stayed up all night oh. and I got through the first, I got through 11 songs. It wasn't 40. It was 22 songs. I had to learn 40 songs for another job. No, it's 22 songs. I got through the 11th song and I made a tiny boo-boo in the rehearsal room. And Adam and the two musicians, Dave and Matthew, put their, put their instruments down and just stopped and said, what, what, what the F are you doing? What the hell are you doing? <laughs> I said, I, I'm sorry, I said, don't be sorry, just don't do it again. If you do that in front of a show, I'll kick you out of the band in front of 3,000 punks. I went, okay. Mm. And they said, are you a hippie? I said, no, no. I said, are, are, we, are we jamming, guys? Is this a jam? You know, they, they, <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it was like hardcore. My first morning, I made one mistake after learning 22 songs overnight. And on the 11th song, I made the tiniest little boob, boo-boo. And um, that was, so I, he said, well, you know, it's up to you. So we better get on with the next stop. So I never made another mistake after that. <laughs> <laughs> In my other bands, we'd all laugh and say, oh, yeah, let's just start again. You know, everyone made mistakes every now and then. No, those guys didn't. Anyway, so those guys telling me, you know, a week or two later, I've got to come up with something. I, I listened to all this stuff, and there was one track on that 23 song cassette which had a track called um, uh, Burundi Black and it was like a seven years funk interpretation of the a recording of the uh, royal dramas of Burundi in Africa from Burundi the country and several artists have used that recording and um, but so it was that recording was like clavinet played over the top but the B side was just purely the African stuff with no overdubs so I loved that. I, and I loved it since it first came out when I was about nine. I don't know, I was a kid. And we'd play at our Christmas parties because we had African neighbors and we had Jamaican neighbors and we would all, you know, dance and sing along to this African drum beat. And I had a little drum and I would play this little drum. And um, so I remembered that. I thought, oh, wow, that's that. So I thought, well, that to me sounds like ants because it was a tri- it was a triple in beat it just went ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. so I, I thought well that's like six legs <laughs> you know, blum, 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 blum. <laughs> and um in my crazy teenage brain i'm thinking well that's kind of out music 
so and I got it on the bass. So I muted the strings and sort of demonstrated that. I went to the rehearsal, and um, you know, and they all said, "Well, what you got?" And I said, "Well, I've got this beat." And I did it on the muted strings. And Adam went, "That's great, Dave. Why don't you do it with him?" So he did it with me. And then Matthew did it. And then then Malcolm came in and said, "That's your sound." <laughs> <laughs> It was a very powerful sound, all muting our strings with the Dave, Dave drums, all in sync, rhythm with it. And, um, and Adam used it later on after we'd split it from him. He used it in Kings of the World Frontier. Okay. But, um, our, our version was much faster, more frantic, and more punk. His was better produced and had you know, more depth to it and was slower. But we were just too young and crazy to... He was a lot older and more mature, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, that, that's, that's kind of how that conglomeration of influences came together. I hope I haven't rambled on too much. No, I think um, if you listen back to the, the early stuff you did in the Bow Wow Wow albums, I mean, there's stuff that you're playing on the bass and, you know, the stuff you're doing, you didn't hear a lot of other people that were able to pull that off. I think it was incredible, the stuff you were doing. And, you know, you definitely deserve to be like on those best bassist lists, you, you kind of seem like maybe you're oh, overlooked you. sometimes, uh, which is unfortunate, but I know a lot of stuff you were doing out there was pretty great. All right. Thank you. No, no, I, I do get mentioned cause I, you know, I, I'm vain enough to have, I don't, <laughs> but every now and then my, my, my name comes up. Oh, another guy you should think of is Lee Gorman. And yeah, I, I, I studied bass. I was obsessed with it, you know? And, um, I used, like I say, I used to go in, right in front of the bass players I liked and, and watch them. I went to see Stanley Clark. I couldn't get that close to Stanley Clark. It was a big gig. But if it was guys like um, Percy Jones, I used to try and figure out what the hell he was doing. And, you know, and if there was a TV show or, you know, a film recording of a bass player that I liked, I would stop it and pause it and see what they were doing. <laughs> you know, that's how I learned. Plus, playing by ear. And, you know, I did martial arts too. And I, you know, I, you know, I was into Bruce Lee as a lot of kids were back then. And he always was talking about economy of movement. You know, he's one inch punch, that kind of thing. So I was always watching uh, how, you know, a lot of, of bass players would, would, would not, a lot of the good ones wouldn't move their hands that much because they would put all their movement into their speed and their note. And then later on, I realized you had to put on a bit of a show. So you had to exaggerate some of your movements. So it looked like you were doing something rather than just watching your hand. And it's hard to, you know, do the minimum movement to, to hit every note. That's how I did it. That's how I could achieve a certain speed. Anyway, if that makes any sense. <laughs> no, no, definitely. Well, Lee, I wanted to ask you the, um, the success of, of I Want Candy. How did you guys feel at the time when that song hit? It seems like a lot of people were probably introduced to you because of that song, but also maybe people stopped at that song and, and didn't discover, you know, the other cool stuff you were doing before and after. I mean, was it kind of a, a blessing or, or a curse or, or maybe both? Well, I, I, it, I think it was much more of a blessing than a curse because, you know, we've gained benefit out of it in terms of recognition, as you mentioned. And it's a fun song to play. And uh, it, it's, it's our version of it, or even though we didn't write it, it's our arrangement. And um, the, the, some of the hardcore fans from England that l l liked us from Adamant days, um, they, they got a bit pissed off. They thought it was a little, you know, lame, I suppose. But not many. No, I mean, the reason we did it was because, <laughs> you know, we were trying to do tours in America because we knew that that was where the key to any in, enlarging any, on any success would be to tour America. And I always wanted to do that. And I got a call at 3 a.m. one morning from McLaren, Malcolm McLaren, our manager, saying that RCA, our label at the time, didn't want to give us any tour support in the U.S. because we didn't have a radio-friendly hit. And the single we were about to put out was um, Go Wild in the Country. You know, before that, we'd put out C30, C60, C90 Go with the Burundi beat I mentioned earlier. And... Um, they were regarded as, you know, too too weird for Americans. And Malcolm said, yeah, especially that bass on the song Go Wild in the Country. <laughs> so it's just too much of that crazy bass, Gorman. It's all your fault. Um, 
I do send him those. I said, Malcolm, it's not. It's, you know, all right, it's a bit crazy, but I make it, try and make it commercial and melodic and support the vocal. And the vocal's got great hooks. And um, he's like, well, you know, we've got to think of something. We've got to think of something, Gorman, or, or, or we're out of it. I said, all right. He, he said, what about a bubblegum song? I said, bubblegum? You mean like the Archies, Sugar Sugar, you know, the, that little movement in the 60s? So I said, you know, what about the what about Sugar Sugar? I thought I couldn't imagine Sugar Sugar by the art just being made like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we, we, we kind of left that phone call, not concluded, but that was, that was the thing. So Malcolm carried on and um, he got through to some people in New York. He got through to Kenny Laguna, who wrote one of the, he was in the 1910 Fruit Gum Company that wrote that song, Simple Simon Says, which was a, which was a hit in the 60s, I think, or early 70s. That was a bubblegum song. You know, they were, he was part of that whole Richard Gotter uh, scene, you know, with all those guys in New York writing those bubblegum hits. And um, I liked that form. I, I thought the, the, the bubblegum songs were the classic three-minute pop song were kind of a, a 20th century work of art. I know it's kind of a bit highfalutin, but I enjoyed that. I liked having nice hooky choruses that you can remember and you can sing along to that stay in your mind and make you feel in a cheerful mood. I thought that was great. You know, what, can you, what, what, what more is there you know, to, to do in music, I thought, at the time. So I didn't come up with the idea. A guy called Steve Leeds, from, uh, he was a friend of Candy Laguna's, came up with the idea of doing I Want Candy, which I vaguely knew about at the time. But the record company, the American RCA branch of that the American branch of ICA flew us to Miami and got us this big budget with a studio, got us Kenny Lagoon, uh, Joan Jett was there, and they were fantastic and a band. You know, it was a great experience. We recorded it at Criterion Studios in Miami. And we weren't really given, we were given cassettes at the airport when we landed and we listened to them on our Walkmans, the original one, the original I Want Candy song. And I thought, I thought, well, we, yeah, we can do this. We can make this into something. And then we rehearsed in someone's garage. <laughs> like, I think the next morning, uh, we routined the song with Kenny Laguna in the room. And we just, we just changed it into, a, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, verse, chorus, and put a little bit of our, you know, I put a bit of that scratching thing in there. And I made up a, a rhythm that was a bit like a marching band, you know, like da 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 if that makes any sense. But anyway, and um, <laughs> and uh, I was trying to show Dave the beat, which is the Bo Diddley beat, and I was playing it with my thumb and playing the off beats with my nail. So it's boom, 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 boom. And Dave didn't play the obvious thing, which is the, the Bo Diddley beat. He played around it with his timbales, so he sort of Latinized it a little bit. And Dave, Dave's family are from Mauritius, which is in the Indian Ocean. And believe it or not, even though it's a country in the Indian Ocean between Africa and India, the music they play there is Calypso. <laughs> <laughs> so he was familiar with with that feel. So he, he, he took to that stuff like you know, so he, he added that element. I I was denoting the and then I hit you know, the um the chords in the in the chorus and Matthew, the guitar player, he played the melody and he put some sort of power chords stabs in the in the chorus you know and he, he and kenny he just went around saying yeah 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 that's great that's great that's great and we all came up with our bits together and arranged it i don't know in about half an hour we did it we've been playing together for two or three years two years at that point so we had a sort of um shorthand between us and i knew that it had to be like first chorus first chorus and not it, the structure of the original was kind of a little bit fractionated so i just evened it out and we weren't like technical songwriters. We just uh, did what I knew was the basic pop format, and um, and we just recorded it. And, and uh, I think I've I think I've rambled on enough. <laughs> but anyway, we enjoyed doing it. It's been a, a, a huge fun to do every show. Still, I don't get sick of playing it. I enjoy playing it. It has an original feel to it. It's our arrangement. It was well recorded and produced by Kenny. And what, and what else? I mean, uh, and we got paid. We, you know, it never hasn't made us a million dollars, that's for sure. But, you know, we, 
it's helped us over the years. The Royal is, we've never made a huge amount of money overall, but like I say, it was our best selling one. And it opened us up just like uh, the record company were complaining that it was a radio friendly song that introduced millions of Americans and people all over the world to, to us, to Bow Wow Wow. I hope you can edit that down. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's uh, it's fascinating how it all came together, and I mean, you still hear that song now in, in films and in commercials. I mean, it's uh, you guys are definitely uh, still riding the wave, as you said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's calmed down. It was about ten, fifteen years ago, it was in so many films and and uh, commercials and and uh, and TV shows. It was great. It's it's calmed down a lot now. Well, Lee, you mentioned uh, in the beginning. Uh, being confused about, uh, you know, which Bow Wow Wow. I wanted to ask you about that. I know Annabella has her own thing going on. Are, are, are you guys, um, I don't know what your relationship is like these days, but um, you're able to, to coexist, it sounds like? Yeah, I mean, the world is a big place. I mean, she left. I, t- I don't say anything, you know, I don't say anything bad about anything because I think it's it's not a good look <laughs> when you do that. Annabella left, uh I think it was about eleven, about ten years ago now, and she just left, and um, and I was the guy running the band, and we had uh, some shows coming up, and I had to promote. Basically, said, you know, if I, I don't honor on the contract, he's going to sue me, so I had to find a singer. No choice. I'd already signed the contract, and she decided not to do the show and sure. leave the band, and so I found another singer. It wasn't like a a big. I was very disappointed. I didn't want her to leave. <laughs> you know, I tried to talk her out, but it didn't do any good. And, and she just wanted to go off and do her own thing. So, you know, um, I had to respect that. So, but I had to find a singer to, to cover the, the contract. Uh, and it worked. And um, so I carried on, you know, because I love playing the music. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you guys have a bunch of shows lined up now and things are going well. And Lee, could we see any new music uh, from either Bow Wow Wow or, you know, something from you or anything like that coming up? I have written some new songs. Problem is, you know, running around, it, uh, <laughs> I used to have my own store. I had three commercial studios in, in, um, in England. I mean, I, I was doing mainly dance music, but I did production and uh, I even produced Mountain McLaren's album, Paris, in, in Paris. I lived in Paris for a year, working with Mountain McLaren. I did a lot. I did, I don't know, a hundred commercials. I did all that stuff. So I was around the studio world. Now I'm living in America. I'm not around the studio world. So it's hard to get in there. I'm making excuses now. <laughs> but no, I've written new material in the Bow Wow vein. And it's fun stuff. And um, just have to get around to recording it. So that's basically it. It exists, but it's not recorded. But I will be recording new stuff. Excellent. Well, you got a lot of stuff going on, as we've mentioned here. Is there anything else maybe in the works or, or something else we should be watching out for? Um, yeah, I mean, the singer I'm working with, Madeline, uh, or Dame Madeline, that's a, a, a professional name, Madeline Feller. She does lounge jazz music and all kinds of stuff. And uh, she plays in Las Vegas. And uh, I might be doing some of that too, because uh, if you listen to the music I did with Malcolm McLaren and his solo albums. I worked on that Paris album in the 90s, and we used a lot of jazz. You know, I worked with some fantastic jazz players in London and, and Paris. And uh, I also produced Gary Kemp's solo album, Little Bruises. And I, I worked with a lot of great music. I booked my favorite bass players. I booked um, Pino Palladino, who was fantastic. I booked... Uh, the rhythm section of the Sugar Hill Gang. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were great too. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, we had a good budget. It didn't get re- released in a big way because, you know, there were internal record company problems. Let's put it that way. It was nothing to do with us. But uh, if you listen to those things, you know, I, I like to think I, I, I achieved a high standard of production. And uh, Malcolm was pleased with the result. And we did a song with um, Catherine Deneuve, the French actress called Pali Pali. And I think it was at number one in Poland for six weeks. <laughs> 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 and it gets used in movies and stuff like that. And, and a lot of the music from that album. I used, that was a lot of world music, a lot of music from Algeria, um, 
and Africa. We used African choirs singing, and uh, but I based it on the on the music of uh, Eric Satie. I was, you know, the composer at the turn of the century, the French composer, who I think was like the the musical equivalent of Van Gogh, because he, he it's is a weird, obviously not quite well mentally uh, <laughs> guy, uh, but it somehow it, it, his a different look upon life, his non you know his non neurotypical uh, brain came up with this haunting music. Um, you used to hear it a lot. You still hear it in commercials called the Gymnopodies. Yeah, that that melody that goes da 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 da. I can't sing it. But anyway, you'd know it if you heard it. So anyway, I, I got that, those modes and translated them into with got jazz trumpeters to play them, and we used it for Levi commercials, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so then Malcolm said, "Well, we should just turn all this stuff into an album." So we did. We converted, you know, we changed the music because we're not allowed to use the same music for the commercial as the album. So we changed. I changed the, you know, the music around, but the basic idea was there. And that was another thing I did with Malcolm. And it, it, it was, you know, it didn't reach commercial success, but it did, you know, a lot of people come up to me and talk to me about that album. And I, I might even go to Paris to redo some of that. That that would be fun because, I, you know, I'm still in contact with some of the people that I made it with. And um, I'd like to redo it. You know, Malcolm has passed away. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2010. And uh, if he was still here, I, I probably would have done something else with him. Cause I, I, I don't know, somehow he used to bring out the best in me. So I think I've talked enough. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's fascinating. Um, it's been an honor speaking with you, and um, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. And thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Oh, and thank you for asking me. It's indeed a pleasure. I think I had a bit too much coffee before, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it won't be too hard to edit it all down. No, that's okay. I, I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. And uh, let me know when it airs. All right, will do. Thank you again. All right, cheers then. Bye, right. Dustin. And again, that was the one and only Lee Gorman, founder and bassist for Bow Wow Wow.